Hello, Rim of the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to be an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon are growing all over the world. This is episode number 423. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hello, everybody. Actually, we're in here on a Sunday again. <laughs> we, have, uh, we still have the really cold temperatures going on, and we're getting ready to come out of them at the end of this next week, or maybe middle of this next week. But right now, they have, a, they have forecasted a, an ice event on Monday morning. And uh, they're saying that the roads could be treacherous. And so unless there's an emergency, we don't get out on those. And so we got a pretty full week, and I wanted to make sure that we didn't get backed up on anything. So we just thought we'd come in here. I don't have any notes. We're just going to talk from our heart and um, just make sure we make contact with you guys because I think it's important. Um, We all, you know, share with each other what's going on and and how we can be prepared, and that's where we're at. I know with... uh you know, God has me has assigned me to write four books in the next year and a half or a year, year and a half. And so we're, I mean, we're looking at a lot of things as, as well as I, I thank God is having me have that heavy load because I think after that season, I think that we may be so busy in so many other aspects of ministry, it's going to be kind of hard to write. And God is saying, these are the things that need to get out. And one of them is going to be on the journey out of Babylon. And I think unless we really... Uh, open up the Word of God with, with honest hearts. And you know, the, the Apostle Paul said to prove all things. You, you question everything, you prove it by Scripture. And man, if we would have done that just in the last 20 years, how much junk would have not gotten into the body of Christ? But I, I think a lot of it can go back, uh, you know, over a thousand years. Too much of, of, of our theologies. And, you know, it's like right now the church doesn't know the difference between a fallen an angel and a demon because in Catholic theology they call them lesser angels. Uh, where when you look at the setting of the New Testament, uh, and we've talked about this before, that uh, the book of Enoch actually uh, was coming in and out of Scripture at that time. And the early church, there was what was called intertextability that the early church was, uh, that considered the book of Enoch at that time canon. And much of the New Testament theology or, or demonology, if you will, in spiritual warfare was drawn from the book of Enoch. And fallen, you know, demonic spirits are not lesser angels. They're the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim spirits that were antediluvian. And so, you know, there's a lot of things like that. Or, or the Augustine uh, doctrine that once you become a member of the church, the devil can't, you know, the devil can't touch you. And there, that has bleeded over into our Protestant theology. And Mary, I see where the devil's is, you know, we, we, our theology and practice are two different things. Well, there's, there's just been a lot of things misunderstood, too, in the body. And huge denominations have built platforms on these, what I call, theories. <laughs> you know, it's, and I think a lot of things have been built on people's personal experiences where you can't establish... You know, a truth based on that, it's got to be um, investigated. You've got to have, you know, elders looking at the word together. And and I just think a lot has been misunderstood. And um, what what I feel like God is having me do during this season is just uh, get as much information as I can from people that have done deliverance, uh, people that have, you know, there's a lot of things that go on in other countries that don't go on here simply because we're not open to them. <laughs> you know, like in Africa and uh, Cambodia, all these different places, there's all kinds of, of things that people have seen and experienced. Um, and so so they're open to, you know, looking at the demonic, looking at what can happen. And the Western world, we kind of have smoothed it over, or we have medicated it, we have, uh, you know, in certain instances, we... We will actually march for the constitutional rights for certain demonic manifestations. I mean, it's crazy what we have done, that we have disconnected ourselves from an understanding of the spirit realm, and we have normalized a lot of this uh, into our culture. Well, and, and we've been geared to walk in fear, yeah. whether people know it or not, through TV and movies and, and different things. Um, they, they always portray 
uh, the kingdom of darkness is so much more powerful than God's kingdom. You know, those old horror movies that I've seen in my past, and it just makes it look like they're so horrific and there's nothing can be done. You know, you never have somebody stand up saying the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, and they poof, you know. And and the truth is, is in, in my experience and what I'm finding with other people that have um, really been involved in deliverance is, is you mostly have to find... Uh, pray and, and ask God how they got an entryway because I, I think a lot of people that, that I'm listening to here lately, I know you've been reading Derek Prince and we've been looking at different things. Um, they, they agree with me uh, as far as like there, it's breaches. It's breaches. It's breaches that come in and there's where, where the kingdom of darkness can influence through. Well, it's in Ecclesiastes that says where there is a break in the hedges where the, where the serpent strikes or the viper strikes. And the, the enemy does this, and I think that we need to go back and return. Re, we have pulled too much terminology that gives the wrong impression. And sometimes uh, there, there are things that have been mistranslated in the Bible, especially the, the King James Bible and others, where they talk about demon possession. That Greek word does not mean possession. It means influence. And now there can be different levels of influence to um, subtle influence that may cause you to be prejudiced against something or, or alter your, your perception of things, that we can have that. Uh, to people that have been in rituals like the Mad Man of Gadara, that there was a, uh, I, I, in research, and I'm tapping into some of Tom's Horn's research, that I don't really think that he was uh, making the connections that I did. But the uh, the Mad Man Adair was most likely in a thesmorphic uh, ritual that was about Dionysus. And it starts with they, they do a ritual. They're supposed to pull these demons out of hell, and they go into these little piglets. And those little piglets go among the people, and the spirit of Dionysus gets hold. And it's a big drunken orgy and all kinds of things. And, there was, and if animals would, would go in the midst of them, uh, bestiality would go on. And if the animals resisted, they had the strength to rip those animals from limb to limb, and they would eat them raw. And this was such a heinous practice that Rome had outlawed it. And so there, there, are, there are many theologians that believe that that guy had gotten separated from the crowd. So when they did the end of the ritual, the end of the ritual is, uh, you know, the, the priest or whatever does his little incantation, and those, then the, the spirit of Dionysus leaves the people, goes back into the piglets, and they kind of run over this little ravine showing that the, the, the uh, devils are going back to hell, and the people are set free. He got separated. All the manifestations that he did was, was and, and it was in the Decapolis area, which was a Gentile area where these pagan practices would have went on. And so through this ritual, he opened himself up to extreme influence. And I think there were people that had been involved in the cult. Why we see the difference from maybe the enemy subtly coming in and start whispering in your ear and kind of gaining control that way like a Jezebel spirit or an Ahab spirit or whatever, to this level of manifestation, it's, it's, it's still not possession. The, that demon does not own that person. But they can definitely control them they can control them because of, of what they have done it's you know it's a difference between a little crack in a wall and opening up something big enough to drive two semi side by side through in their life they they he did a ritual that gave himself completely over to that spirit right. and so and so uh, jesus drove that spirit out of property that that demon didn't belong uh, I, I think i think part of what we need to do in our theologies let's go back to the original language and make sure that it is lining up with what is it being expressed there rather than uh, just all the terminology that we use because possession has a different connotation than demonic influence. Uh, you and I have seen people that would have somebody come into life and that person's not possessing them, but they sure are influencing their lives in a bad way. Except this is internal. They, they have given an open door where the, the area of the soul is where the demonic work, they work on emotions, they work on whispering in your ear and all these different things. And so we've got to, we, we, have, we have got to get our theology right so that we can shut the doors and that we can approach, whether it's a deliverance, inner healing or whatever, we need to go back and do it from a proper biblical model. And so I think the task of the remnant in this day and this hour is to do the homework and do the research. And I, I think it's going to take 
Um, even if you if, even if you don't understand Greek and Hebrew, but you can, there are a lot of programs out there, Mary, that are already keynoted Strong's. You can use that Strong's number, and you can look it up in Thayer's. Uh, you can look it up in Vines. You can look look it up in a lot of different different level lexicons to to make sure that what we're saying a word means is really what it means because. You know, at the beginning of the Reformation, where we had the King James Bible, there there was so much that was still um, expressing in their theologies that were that were Catholic driven. Even though they they said these things of the Catholic Church we disapprove of, but this other we, and so they were in the process of redefining everything. And, and you you see later on in the Reformation movement that they begin to be. Uh, you know, it's like with the Lutheran Church is kind of one step away from Catholicism, and then you go into some of the others, and there was a there was a wide gap because the more they learned and the more they did their own research, and I think that's in in our day we're we're in another Reformation. I think we're in the what I call the Third Reformation. The first one was the Book of Acts. You know, Jesus came and he, re, he there was a Reformation that went on that that was reforming what they had made Judaism. And in that Reformation, it expanded to include the Gentiles. Then we have 1,000 years that was the, what we call the, the, uh, the Dark Age. The Protestant movement comes out of that, and we have the Second Reformation. And now we're having the Third Reformation to restore all things and put everything in order before the Lord comes back. Which means, you know, if, if we're going to have to bring our A game, uh, you know, I, 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 I have seen people that have not served in the military that think that they know about you know, certain tactics and different things. And it's actually the opposite of what I was taught in the military because they have never went through the official training. And I think there were, tactically, we're going to have to get our theology straight because we're, we're approaching the end of this thing, whether it's spiritual warfare, whether it's understanding the proper place, the commandments of God to play in the life of every believer or the feast of every believer or how to detect whether something comes from Babylon or the kingdom of God. All these things are necessary in this day because we're, we're getting ready to fight the final battle. And if we're going to, if we're going to be God's A-team, we're going, to, we're going to be God's special forces in the last days, we can't think like people still going through basic training that are just learning. We're, we're going to, and, and I think what God is doing now is God is providing a grace on us so that we can learn, I, I think he. I think what we're going to see in the days ahead is that the Holy Spirit is even going to orchestrate certain situations so that there's practical application so that we can say, you know, was my theory, is it really true in practice? Uh, you know, when you, you look in science, theory is an unproven hypothesis, okay? When you have fact... It's because you can, you can replicate it time and time again under scientific conditions. Well, the authority of the believer always works. Always works mm -hmm. if you follow the instructions. Yeah, and I think we have talked about this before, that you get in trouble when you take that authority, but then, and it works. It will always work with the believer because we've been given authority. But then the problem comes in is if you have these breaches we've talked about. Yes. And so then the enemy has to leave, but then there's an immediate plan for retaliation. And it may not be soon, but they've got a plan down, down the road that says, you think you can stop us? Well, watch this. Because they know, it's like we've said, they know everything about us. I think that there are... There have been spirits that watched us our whole lives because they, they know that the, the threat of the remnant. And so they've done everything they can to try to make it impossible for the remnant to come out of the bondages, out of uh, mostly wounds, I think. Yes. I mean, everybody's been so wounded in one way or another, and, it's, and trying to make your way th uh, to healing because once you have a wound, it's very easy for a, a spirit to attach and try to make you resentful and try to make you bitter. And, um, oh, absolutely. And then yeah. when you put on top of all this, Mike, what has been done through technology now and what they know that they can do through um, the airways and through frequencies. And um, I've watched so many of the, the preachers that are, are now exposing what's going on in churches. 
And there was one uh, Jeremiah Johnson was talking about, and he showed this clip of a New Year's Eve service, and and it showed them all just kind of swaying back and forth to this music, and he said that he couldn't even put it up on the screen because of the lyrics were so horrible that he that they couldn't even put it on the screen. And so I think that we've got a lot further along than than people have realized in the debauchery creeping into the church. And so there's, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know we're going to go through a cleanup period like nothing we've ever seen. I think everything that that God is going to expose is going to be exposed this year. And I think we're going to be shocked, flabbergasted, <laughs> aghast, mm-hmm. looking for more, more adjectives. Uh, and when, when the field clears, I think most of the body of Christ is going to be dumbfounded who's left standing because I, I think a lot of, uh, of what we call uh, the mega church ministries and stuff, a lot of them, now not all of them, but a lot of them have built up on, on false precepts uh, that, uh, that are, are beginning to come. I, I think that, you know, the, the, Jesus, when he talked about the wheat and the tares, he said, while it's growing, you really can't tell the difference until the thing's fully mature. We're coming to a place where there's going to be a level of maturity manifest in everything so that its delineation is clear, that we're going to see uh, if, if there's sin in the church, if there's sin in the leadership, I think we're going to enter into a season where Almighty God is going to make sure that all of it's revealed and dealt with. Well, I think he's he's doing that, you know, for his purposes of having a, a cleansed church, but um, we're, we're going to have to learn that we can be influenced yes. by the kingdom of darkness or or we won't even have a chance because we're going to be fighting things that we don't understand. And, I mean, I've seen things that I still to this day don't know how that happened. I don't know how that person did that or I, I really don't. And I've been seeking God for years on it, and I think he just slows me sh- slowly shows me things as I go so it won't overwhelm me. But, um, I mean, there's, there's some heinous things going on. There is, and we need to realize as long as we're alive on planet Earth, we are in the battlefield, mm-hmm. period. Uh, and the battlefield isn't something, you know, people's idea of spiritual warfare is you go in your backyard and you yell at the devil for 45 minutes and you think you're done and you walk away, and then you can go back to normal life where you like you can pretend as if there's no warfare. That's not that's not the way warfare works. It, that we you know when when I was in the military one of the things they drilled in me is you're on duty 24/7. Now you can be back in the barracks. You can but we you know, the war can break out. The 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 enemy has agents that try to gain access to classified information and to gain influence is what mm-hmm. we're talking about. And, and so you have to constantly be on guard on that. And somehow or another that we have, we have thought that spiritual warfare happens momentarily in these little fragments, not realizing, like the Apostle Peter said, you need to be vigilant and sober all the time because the enemy is looking for a way to get in. And, and he, is, he is nefarious in the way that he does it. Now, we, you mentioned about, let's say, a wound in your life, that wound did not happen by accident. Anybody that ha- that has an open door to the devil can become a momentary agent of the kingdom of darkness to wound you. Because hell wanted you wounded to create the head, the open, the opening in the hedge, and said, "We're going to wound you at ten, so that when you're twenty-five, we can start doing this stuff here." I think that's exactly how they work. You know, one thing that I was going to bring up and just have you comment on a little bit, and we, um, you probably all heard by now the um, what has happened with IHOP, um, where Mike Bickle has has been separated from them because of a scandal, and I wasn't going to mention it uh, to anybody for a while because I I thought well maybe this it could be a false accusation that happens, and it's come I think he admitted one and what the the investigation is is. Um, looking like is that there have been other um, women that that were involved and and you know there's I think it's easy for anybody to fall into sexual sin and I think um, more grievous is when you would use your position in ministry 
as an influence to get that done or to, you know, and this, this has already been out years ago, but there was a minister called Earl Polk. And when you listen to, to what happened, he actually, um, I think, told the women that this was their duty from God. Something so bizarre that it's just hard to believe, but, but I think that's what happened. Now, and that, that's what they're, they're uh, saying has happened with Mike Bickle. Now, what I wanted to talk to you about, Mike, because um, we've talked about this before, but I, I bet other people have this question, is, is if you've ever, like, listened to Mike Bickle, I mean, he, he sounds like he's, he's a good teacher. You know, I probably wouldn't agree with some of the stuff that I like of most of the people. I don't agree with everything they're saying, but there was some some good teaching there. Um, and that one thing that I was more concerned about years ago, because when I first came out of my depression, was when we were traveling quite a bit and like just going to services. And I was just so hungry. I was just trying to find more truth. And and we went to uh, we went uh, the girls and I went up before you to a Passion for Jesus. Yeah, conference. I, was, I was in Ohio at a different conference. And so you joined us later, but we went up ahead, and um, that was Mike Bickle's organization that had that. Yeah, and, and Paul Kane Paul was Kane there. Paul Kane was there and, and different people. And so when when we were there, um, I, just, I just thought, actually what I went in there for is I thought, okay, God, if these are real prophets— then if there's if there's anything in me, if there's something that, that I need to see, then you use one of them and show me. And I will deal with anything that's there. Because, I mean, I, I knew I was, I'd been in a mess. I wanted to make sure that, that um, I was getting, you know, cleansed from anything of, of the kingdom of darkness. And so when I went in there, I, my discernment was operating. And there was, there were these people that were doing the only thing I know how to call it is a whip. It's like it's like it'd start down to their feet and it'd kind of whip them up and over, and and they kept doing that. And, and it, I was getting sick to my stomach again, and and I was just questioning myself, thinking, man. And then at the end, they said, now everyone gather in groups and start praying for each other. This one session we were at, and I was there with the girls, and I grabbed a hold of them, <laughs> and I said, we're our group. Nobody else is gonna lay hands on us. I just felt. I just felt like something was wrong. And now nothing that they said, I didn't hear anything that I said. Of course, in my, um, you know, the beginning stages of me really learning the word, that alarmed me. But there were things going on. And so... There, there was an atmosphere that was different, I know. when Whenever I get around prophetic people, it stirs up the prophetic in me. And I, I remember... You know, I get around doc, when Dr. Marianne Brown was alive. When I got around her, it's just like there was a flame burning in my heart because she was so strong. Oh, yeah, that. me too. And, mm-hmm. and many others, yeah. Lester Summerall, when, when I was in St. Louis, uh, you, uh, you, I could feel when he entered mm-hmm. the building. Uh, I'm up there, and, and Paul Kane is doing and ministering and stuff, and I feel like I'm in the presence of a soothsayer. There is absolutely no anointing well, whatsoever. Well, I, I didn't detect it either, but I was, I, I was questioning myself more than anything else. And and I and there was a scandal that came out about him, him later, yeah. and so um, my you know my question is to you, Mike, is this a double stream? How how can these people operate here, and and it seems like it's right, but then something that is going on, you know, that's um, the the known fact of what happened with um, Earl Polk. <laughs> no. Nope. There were the two scandals, and one was Jim Baker, and the other was Jimmy Swaggart. Swaggart. That's the one I was talking about. Because now I, I have heard Jimmy Swaggart. I've heard some of his sermons, and, Mike, they were powerful. Okay, so then you had that. You had that that being done, but you had that going on on the side. Well, I, I think, Help us I, I think there, I think I think there's three things going on. I think there's the double stream. I warn about that in my books that – that if you have a wound or something in your life, that uh, Lucifer, when you when you read about him, that he was the anointed cherub that covered. Mm-hmm. He guarded the presence of God, and he has the ability to reside right over the manifested presence of God. That if we got there in our condition now, we we would be a match there. That have been it. I mean, and so he can his anointing can hover right over the top of of God's anointing. And so when, when a minister has these places in their lives, they can have a double stream. And so they can speak actual truth. Yeah. It's not all some big 
No. And um, so, so you have that, then you have, and you and I have seen those with the prophetic that they were giving a prophetic word. And I mean, it was so spot Yeah, on. you would witness. And then it. at the very yeah. end, it would veer to the left or right. That was that double stream coming in, taking over and veering it off because there were things they hadn't dealt in their lives. And that's, that's one of the things that were, uh, in, in Bible college and seminary, we're, we're taught how to exegete scripture. We're taught how to preach and, and to orate and all these different things. But we're not taught to take out the garbage. We're not taught to deal with our own issues the way that we should. And you, you have that going on. Um, I think we also have uh, people that are program multiples. Uh, I know Russ Dizdar talked about a guy that was pastoring a very large church that he had a back part that was a raging Satanist that would kill you in a heartbeat if, if that part came up. But the, the other option that we need to examine and this is where we failed because we didn't realize what was going on. God said, listen, here's how you judge prophets. First of all, if you know if what they say doesn't come to pass, then, then of course, it's, then, and they, it has to be pretty specific because, I mean, there are a lot of things Isaiah said that we had to wait two or three hundred years. Right, for so them there to come isn't pass. something right away you can judge it. <clears throat> but he said, he said, now listen. If everything they said came to pass, I mean, there were things, uh, there are stories about Paul Cain where he said, uh, God has a word for me to give you, and there's going to be a uh, 6.2 earthquake tomorrow in your area, and when the, when the rumbling settles down, I'll be standing in your lobby. And that, that happened with a, with a guy with a denomination, and then he, it was kind of like the road for him to begin influencing that church group. But he, God said this, he said, listen, if everything, he, if everything they say come to pass, but either the lifestyle they leave or they begin teaching things that lead you away from my ways, mm-hmm. then I was testing you to see if you love signs and wonders more than you love me. And Mary, in that area right now, the church has failed because we have not examined. Uh, and in fact, I remember there was a time, this was back years ago, uh, Rod Parsley was calling out networks that uh, said, you, you don't check the guy's life out that's preaching. All you, all you make sure is that the check clears. And, of course, the network's response was they cut his time in half. Now, right after that, he was restricted to a half-hour broadcast. Um, I, I think so much of what has, we have looked at the the wrong results. We've looked at, there, there, are, there are three areas the enemy always works at, and it, it comes down to PMS, power, money, and sex, okay? And he tries to either he tries to tempt us with influence, or he says, listen, if you go this direction in your theology, that's where the money is. And a lot of churches have skewed their theology because that's, that's what brought in the crowds and brought in the money. Well, if you're, if you're trying to build a Babylonian church, that's wonderful, okay? That's, you're, you're, you're working with Babylon. And the other is when you begin following down that stream, the sex part of it will eventually show up too. And I, I think that's what we have seen, that the models of the American church are not biblical models. I think that's one of the reasons that Dr. Mary Ann Brown said that what God's getting ready to do with the church, it's going to look nothing like it does today. And I think the reason for that is that you know, the, the church is, is a theocracy. It's not a democracy. That there has to be checks and balances on the integrity of the individual. I mean, there's, there's checks that, that we have in place. It's like, you know, if, if I'm in the building alone, nobody gets in. Okay. Right. That uh, I'm, I'm, you know, it would be inappropriate for you to be in the building with a man by yourself. It's inappropriate for me to be in the in the right. building, and, and not that you and I would do anything, but then somebody would have a, a an opportunity for a false accusation, because you know there are some people that you don't know what's going on with them, because we've had to deal with DID and and occult people coming and everything else, and so there has to be these constant checks and balances. Yeah, and that was something I had to learn, because when uh, when this first started and all these occult people were coming after us and stuff, I was just on a mission. I was going to get these kids safe and. I was no more thinking about protocols or, or anything like that than a man in the moon. And I think that's why I, I, you know, like that time I gave somebody our cell phone. Stupid to let them take that cell phone. They could have done no telling what with it. And then brought, and there's so many things that I did years ago just 
Um, and, and I didn't understand. I didn't understand how you can sit and command something to come out of somebody, and it sits there, and you can see the demon in them, and it sits there and smiles at you and just leaves. And, you know, there's so many things that I, that I would, would go through, and I'd think, okay, this doesn't line up with the way I'm thinking, so something's wrong. Yeah. And I knew, I knew it was past the time, like, where I knew my authority. I'd, I'd asked forgiveness for sins. I already knew that I, I had had something happen to me where my mind had been compartmentalized. I already knew that. So it didn't make sense to me. And then, you know, I had to learn um, about if a person is, is split, their whole whole being has to want to get rid of those, you know, the influence of, of the kingdom of darkness. And it, it takes a while sometimes to get to that place before you can get everything out. Well, absolutely. Cause, you but know, they have a legal right to be there. Yeah, because with some, fam- you know, there's, there's a difference between somebody being split in basic programming and somebody coming out of the Illuminati, okay? Because you have had occult trained back parts that may be very high in, mm-hmm. in witchcraft. And so they're sitting there in the background, and they're not going to let go of their demons because they're using them to attack you the whole time they put this little, oh, help me, help me out up front. We, we saw that. And so, and so, and, and that demon will only manifest when that person's, that personality manifests because it's encapsulated behind a wall with that personality, which has really been um, disturbing for people that had, that, you know, they're, that didn't, weren't aware of that, that had real discernment. It's like, okay, um, why is that all I sense is a brick wall? With you, I, mm-hmm. I can't sense anything. There's a brick wall. That's because there's a brick wall in their mind on the other side, is then that demonic, and you have to take care of it when that part comes up. And of course, I, I think that's probably about twenty percent of, of ministry. The rest, I think, for the body is dealing with the the tacit influence the enemy constantly has. I think a, a, a part of the discipleship process, when we're taught to do it right, God shows us something, we repent of it. We command anything that that any influence the enemy had in our lives that came with that to leave. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of self deliverance that can happen as a part of the discipleship process that we're never taught. Well, I know that's what happened with me. I mean, I I didn't have anybody that I trusted other than you, so I just sit in front of you and say, "You watch my eyes," because I'd seen demons in other people's eyes. Yeah. Uh, and I said, you watch it, see if that, you know, the pupil shrinks. If it, it, tell me anything, Did it red circles in her eyes, show me. Um, and I think it was, I think because all of me, I I got through the breakthrough to where all of me wanted to be rid of anything. Uh, it was, it didn't seem so difficult. Uh, what was was the hard part for me was getting my my uh, mindsets and my thought patterns to get in line with God's word. Yes, um, we, we had given in to doctrines of demons. And now, guys, that, that word is a Hebraic word of your worldview and how you live is, is a biblical doctrine. This is the way we do things. And so demons over the years and within our it influence families, influence society around us, they begin building this is the way that you live. And then and I, I heard... Um, Isaac Rodenberg said, he said, God's really rude because he comes on the scene and says, you're all wrong, I'm right, and this is the way you do it, and quit doing it that way. But is it is, And he said, it sounds rude, but he said it's actually a great expression of love if everything that you do, all the ways that you think, all the, way that, the ways that you react, you're destroying yourself. Wouldn't you, if you love somebody, said, you sit down and listen to me. Do this, not this. Think this way. Don't think this way anymore. You treat people this way. You don't treat people this way. He said, it, is it not what a loving parent would do with a child that's being self-destructive? And that's very logical, except sometimes the demons can stop the people from even hearing what you said. How many people yes. have, we had to sit down and, and teach them the same thing over and over and over till they got it because there was something blocking them even hearing it. And, I, and it, then you've got the whole situation where... People have been taught a false Jesus, and they think yes. they're saved. And I can tell you, we ran into some that weren't saved. They were serving a false Jesus, and once you got that reestablished to where they accepted the real Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, then everything started falling apart because it was all based on that. And, and you know, we worked with one young lady, and, and she had been in church all her life, and, and then when a lot of the programming went down, you ask her point blank, do you want to 
to serve Jesus? Do you want to serve God? She said, no, sir, I don't. And she went on and did whatever that's a, she was. That's gonna, as far as we could go because you can't give her the kingdom. If you don't wait to the although kingdoms. God, I think God used a certain situation there on a national level. Believe it or not, um, but I mean, every you know, back then I was thinking, man, we need to teach people protocols on how to do things. But back then, it was a combination of survival and learn what you got to do, and how in the world do you get demons out of people so these little kids are okay? And I mean, it was just it was horrible. I'll just tell you, it was one of the most horrible times. Uh, and I was learning quick, and God sustained us. All glory to Him yeah. because because my stupidity is a wonder that that we didn't I didn't open a door to get us killed or something, but. Um, Thank God yeah. he Back was then, with it us. Was, it was kind of like not putting somebody through boot camp, throwing them in the foxhole with the enemy shooting at you and say, welcome to boot camp. Yeah. yeah. It, it was so bizarre. And then no, absolutely nobody uh, to turn to at that time. You know, we didn't want to put this on somebody else's doorstep. So, you know, at first I thought, well, all, all the Christians hear about this, we'll all come together. And that wasn't how it worked. That place I lived was they so full of fear. Hills. Well, and I, I understand they were, they just had fear. Um, and if you've got, and somehow in what happened to me, I think it's part of that uh, training that they did with the military parts. I, there, there wasn't any fear there, and so God was able to use that in me to to just keep us going forward. But you know, and I learned a lot. But I still think there's more that we need to learn because I think, I think if this is a year when God's saying, okay, you need to come out of Babylon. You need to come out of the system that's built here in the United States and other other countries because I'm getting ready to do something, and you need to be far from it spiritually. You can't be attached to it. And the truth of it is, is everything I look at, everything, the government, the churches, the schools, everything you look at is absolutely Babylon. immersed in Babylon. Babylonian things. Yes, our music, the music that we listen to, they've been using this for so long. Um, it's just unbelievable. You know, a lot of times when I used to minister to people, that the only way I knew how to do it um, was just prof- God would give me something prophetic, and I would send the blood of Jesus into it. And, and sometimes I could recognize, you know, what they had done to a part. And so then you could, you could use that to gain entrance to minister Uh, and plead the blood of Jesus into a place. And so a lot of what God's used with me is that. But I'm telling you, if you don't have some kind of insight into that that programming and what you're dealing with, Mike, you'd go around in circles forever. Oh, absolutely. You know, when when you just look at the advertising industry, and, of course, that advertising has bleeded over into politics and everything else, Mary, they have spent millions upon hundreds of millions of dollars how to control and influence you. Yeah, they have. And, and, when you, and what's interesting, we have a, a video from the Prophecy Club by Al Neal. Uh, and now he had a lot of good information, but listening to him was like watching paint dry on a wall, bless his heart. But it was, there was such good information. And no matter where, like there's you know 666 Park Avenue and, and, and Wall Street and, and different ones, and just how many of these advertising firms built their buildings so that the address of the building was 666, whether it was in Washington, D.C., New York, or, or other places. Well, they taught their personnel how to manipulate. Yeah. And, they absolutely and, and there, knew and, how, to, how to use the commercials to where you, when you're sitting there and they bring up this big juicy hamburger, all of a sudden, you know, you get hungry. Yeah, and, I need a hamburger. And it never looks that way when you no, go and actually sure buy doesn't. one. No, it sure doesn't. But they, they have learned music background and everything else to manipulate you. Uh, they will use fear to manipulate you. I mean, that's that's the part of the news mm-hmm. is, you know, and we, we hear this with uh, political opponents. If this person gets in, it's going to be the end of the world, the end of democracy, and aliens will come and eat us all. You know, it's, it's about that ridiculous. But everything that they do, and, of course, I deal with it in the Shiner Directive, that when they, when they the Cathay tube, which was the first tube for television, and televisions were actually invented by the Nazis, uh, they found that uh, when a person watches it more than just a short period of time, they'll go into an alpha state, shuts down the reasoning side of your mind, and and you begin being programmed. What do they call? What do they call the things that we watch on there? Programming. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and so the and in fact, uh, it was during the Trump administration. I, I think that he so aggravated 
the news media, they begin spilling the beans. And one of them on CNN uh, got really upset because he called it false news. And her response was, we don't report the news. We tell people what they're supposed to think. I thought, aha, for the first time maybe in your professional career, you just told the truth. That everything about society is about influencing you for what somebody else's agenda is. Whether it's politics, whether it's advertising. You, uh, there's not a person listening to this that has not sat down, eaten a full meal, and then go turn on the TV and they'll bring on a commercial and all of a sudden you're hungry again. I think that's where a lot of people snack is they start watching TV and it's just automatic. You want to get a snack or something. I've found it helpful, like if I'm listening to the news or something, I'll make lists of things I have to do or, you know, something that's going on because then then that way you disengage from the mesmerizing effect of it. And then we always plead the blood of Jesus over our eyes and our ears and ask God to let that be a shield Mm -hmm. because you have to hear what's going on, you know, uh, especially if you've got – if you, if you don't have as much time to pray as you used to, which is kind of what's happened with me, um, used to, I could hear a lot of things to pray. And so I, I still try to have that time. But if you hear what they're doing, if you see what they're actually doing or what's being planned, you can go ahead and just pray. And <laughs> you know what to pray. You know you've got to pray about and, it. And all this stuff's creeped over into the church. Uh, you know, there, there are certain ministries that may brag, okay, we've had 10,000 people saved in the last two years. And when you look at what they're preaching, and you look at the fruit of it, how in the world could anybody get saved in those situations? Uh, we were watching this one documentary just talking about baptism, and then they went to these, some of these mega churches, and there were there were people saying, that this is the reason why I'm getting baptized. None of them were for biblical reasons. In fact, this one woman came and she says, I, I, I want to get baptized so that I can command angel armies to protect animals. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, where is that in the Bible? Well, and, and I guess that's what we're all going to have to come to grips with. That's what we're talking about today, is things are going to change in a big, big way. And so we're, we're still in that, in that process of, okay, God, what, what do we need to do? Because we've got the two buildings here, and I've known for a while, um, you know, we were praying about, we told you that, about whether we need to sell that other building, what God wanted us to do, and, and we felt like we're supposed to keep a hold of it. Um, and so we're, we're in the stages of me and Mike really pressing in like we haven't before together and pressing mm-hmm. and asking God for answers and specific things because we, don't, we want to be prepared for whatever's coming, for what God wants us to do. And not only um, in ourselves, because we're, we're sitting here saying, oh, God, what are we going to do? You know, look how bad things are. Uh, it, it, I never walk in fear on that, but I just, I just am concerned. I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what God wants us to do and, and how we're supposed to do things. And so I think I've, I'm getting more and more. I think we're getting more perspective on what we're supposed to do, don't you? On that and I, I want to, you know, what's going on in me and, and I, even beyond the books, because I learn as much when I write the book. Mm-hmm. As I think people are reading it because it's like now a you've always thing. done that because you'll you'll come and show me and you'll say look at this it's almost so, like you didn't write it you know and, and it's like I started this research and it took me down a rabbit <laughs> hole and there's an entire civilization <laughs> down here you know uh, but uh, I think that my my feeling and what I'm researching is God saying listen you're you're about ready to build something and we're at a time that all of us you know if the Lord doesn't build the house those that labor labor in vain yeah that's right and I want every brick in the wall. I want the foundation to be Christ and Christ alone. He has to be the That's cornerstone, it. That's and, it. and that lines up with with the with the uh, with the patriarchs, with the prophets, uh, and no with preconceived the ideas on our part. No, and he, I want it. I want it totally how God wants it. God you know, keeps on reminding over and over again when I pray. He, he reminds me of what D.L. Moody said when because this woman came up to him and said, "How come the Word of God is always so fresh and so powerful when you preach it?" And he says, every time I, I, I go to the Word of God, he says, I purposely approach it like I've never read it before. No preconceived ideas. What it says, and I do the research, and I pray through it. And I, I think that's why the Apostle Paul said, listen, Gentiles, you've been, you have been so programmed by Babylon that it's running out of your ears. We really have. I mean, our nation specifically. I don't believe that we are Babylon. 
Babylon I is be- a worldwide thing. And and I, I think that there's so many things that, that it was the Babylonian area overseas. But I think that, that we definitely have the spirits of Babylon working here. We had all the, the things from Babylon and Egypt brought over here. And, and we've made a foundation on it yeah. um, that well, surpassed the founding fathers even. And go, going back to like the Puritans and stuff, we, it, it overtook it. It did. And it made a place where Satan built a kingdom. And, you know, when you, I mean, when even the founding fathers, they looked to Rome and to Greece. Uh, for, a lot of them were Freemasons. Uh, yeah, a lot of them were Freemasons, which is worldwide. And one of the, one of the things I'm going to have to deal with with the journey out of Babylon, how do you come out of Babylon when Babylon is everywhere. Well, there, there's, it's there's, like the there's, days of the week. We can't change that. No. But I mean, I mean, there, there is not a nation that is not oh, under no, control by a principality no. or power. That if you went to Israel right now, Israel is, is mostly Babylonian. Okay. You, you go America's Babylonian. You, you go to Canada and they're crazy Babylonian. Yeah. I mean, they, they have gone full communist. Where they're, they're, you can't go to Antarctica because now we know the stuff that's down there. So, <laughs> uh, and Steve Quayle saying, "Don't go down." Well, there. and so what God's getting ready to do with us is to prepare us to conquer in the midst of it. Yeah, we need to. I think what God's going to do, God's going to give us a similar anointing that Daniel had. That Daniel was never a part of Babylon, but he prospered in Babylon. Babylon didn't change him. He changed Babylon. And we've got so many things like with the currency and what they've done. And, and so, you know, years ago when I looked at the big picture of this, I thought, how in the world, God, can, can we? And I think it's going to be a shaking like nothing we've ever seen. That's why I don't want people to be alarmed. We're going to see some stuff, and there's no way around it. I mean, there's already judgment so headed at us because of the abortions and the different things that have been done. I mean, God's just holding it back. He's just in his mercy holding stuff back. But some of it's going to get through. It won't matter what we pray. Some of it's coming. And so we have to be prepared for that but not be in fear. Just say, okay, God, you've, you've had us born during this period of time. We are, we are um, your handiwork. You created us and designed us exactly what we need to be to do what you want during this period period of time yes. now the problem is is the old enemy knew that and so he started most of us in the womb working and working and working and working to get us to a place that we could not be effective and so god's god's doing what he always does when satan thinks he's got something sewn up he's going to say watch me watch me <laughs> watch yeah. what i do with my people watch how i i teach them to get free. Watch how, how my, my anointing will go upon those for specific purposes to get this group of people free, to, to free up. You know, we need a, prophet, a true prophetic voice. We need the anointing of, that goes with certain people that can just lay hands on people and they're healed. Yes. There's so many things that, that Satan's tried to stop. But God's bigger. Don't let the, the hugeness of this, of this Babylonian system Make you think that God's not bigger than it. He is so much bigger. Well, one of the, the interesting things is when you read, and you know, I'm trying to understand the end times, and several times God has had me go back, and he says, I always tell you the end from the beginning. You want to understand how to go through the days that are ahead where I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken? Go back and read Exodus. God's people were enslaved mm-hmm. in a mystery religion nation. God judged that nation, but he prepared Goshen's for his people. And we've been slaves and didn't know it. Yeah. Some more than others, like what I went through, but, but we've all been slaves to a degree because none of us have known what's really going on. None of us have, have done real spiritual warfare because you can't do real spiritual warfare unless you know what you're fighting. Exactly. And we and he and Satan's just worked overtime. He gets everybody involved in this, and, and they get involved in this, and then he tries to to get you to make it an idol in your heart, so that if somebody even mentions giving it up, you go, no, don't you even go there. I'm not, I could never get rid of that. Yeah, or you know, in fact, I heard it was you know, was it Jeremiah Johnson. It was one of them that I was listening to. I mean, he was preaching like a house of fire. And he said, listen, a lot of ministries are going to get judged. A lot of uh, those setting in ministry are going to get judged. And if it causes you to doubt your salvation, 
what that what that reveals is you had a, you made that minister into an idol. Mm-hmm. It can happen. Come on now. Uh, I love what the Apostle Paul said. Now, in, 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 when you read it in the English, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. In the Greek, when you read it, he's painting a picture. He's saying, follow me as long as when you look over my shoulder, you see me following Jesus. That's it. And, and the key, uh, oh, go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt. No, and, and that, that's the key. It, it's not how big the crowd, it's not how big the, the ministry building, because Babylon can prosper, Aaron. I think it has done that in our day and our, our, uh, where we're at. But we're, we're in an era, we're in a time that God is going to fulfill what he said in the book of Hebrews. There is a shaking coming. I think the shaking is first going to be on the earth so that he can take some things down so there can be like this exodus out of Egypt. At the same time, what we, what we forget in, in the exodus story, there was a shaking in the heavens because with every single plague that God brought, God was judging a God of Egypt. And the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is the Apostle Paul, said, listen, not only is the earth going to be shaken, but so is the heavens. That there's going to be a lot of thrones of principalities, powers, and rulers of darkness that God is getting ready to knock out of yeah, their thrones. I believe we're getting ready to see it here. It's been, I can see how God strategically has done things, you know, one step at a time. I think the taking, praying over that druidic shield that was over this area was huge. I know God's working us toward a particular point of where um, he's really going to move in this area. And so so we've got to be prepared. But when I was almost interrupting you a while ago, what I was getting ready to say is the key is how much are we willing to change? Because because with me, I had to change everything. Well, if you, if you realize that you have been living in Babylon and you think like a Babylonian and God has called you out, that means you got to change everything. Everything. You know, I had places in my heart that I know were good somehow through all that God had just protected through all that I'd went through because I, I had a love for people. I sure loved kids. Um, I was just... My kids were so precious to me. So there there were things in my heart that were okay. But man, the rest of my soul was such a mess. And and so as God started showing me the things, okay, you know, one of the first things he showed me was I had to ask him to restore what I'd killed in you. I mean, there were so many things that he started showing me. That one wasn't a hard one uh, because I remembered things I'd said and I thought, oh, man, I'd have killed anybody, you know. Um but then there were other things that he, he would bring up to me. And I, I can tell you this, this is, this is going to be hard for people. <laughs> but Christmas is going to be one of the things that people are going to have to give up. And there's a whole bunch of people that we, we love that would disagree with me. But I'm telling you, it's going to be one of those things we, we have to give up. And if, if somebody mentions giving up Christmas to you and you go, <gasps> Idol. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to give it up. Me neither. And I mean, it took me two years to get to the, the place where it was not an idol in my heart. Two years. In my, in my <clears> household, and in, in, I've shared before how my stepfather that ended up adopting me, how that made my life fallacious. The only time that that house was livable was Christmas, the Christmas season. Everybody put on a front. Yeah, it was kind of that way at my house. There wouldn't. My dad never put on a front. It was always rough. But I mean, um, it w- it was a time where everybody just kind of focused on that, and it took the focus off of other stuff. At least front consciousness. Yeah. But there was horrible things going in the back every Christmas. People probably don't believe this, but you know they have all these sacrifices at at Halloween. Probably more Christians would believe on that one. There's a whole bunch at Christmas. There, there, in, in fact, at Christmas time, it's not only a time for human sacrifice, but the the elite, the occult has said, and if possible, it needs to be a Christian. And and I know that there are, are wonderful teachers that have said it's okay to do Christmas. Um, but I'm just going to tell you, <laughs> I'm telling you from, from watching this all these years, from seeing, and I always want to present it from, from the perspective of please don't ever think I'm judging somebody not at all I just know what Satan can do with it 
and I mean he can bring fire into places. He can he can destroy health. I mean mm-hmm. I've I've watched it now for all these years, and and you can say you can go all the way around and say okay it's not this date so it's not Saturday now you know it's not this so we can do this well it brings the body of Christ together. Um, well, right now they're trying to bring the body of Christ together to all say, oh, you can be a homosexual and you can be a cross-dresser and you can do all these things. And we can't We can't just go with the where crowd do we, and where say... Where do we draw the line? And that's, that's you, know, they say, you know, I've had people say, well, this is dividing the body. I know a lot of things that are dividing the body. Right now, just the fallout in the United Methodist Church on, on ordaining the LGBT community, they're losing half their churches. There is, there, there is a dividing going on. And I, I think that in, when, when the shaking comes, there is going to be a great dividing of those that say, I'll follow God no matter what, I, and those that don't. I think we need to, to look at the Christmas, or not the Christmas, the uh, story of Jesus' birth. I think we, could, we can do that. I, I think During it's established by, by Elizabeth and Zachariah and his time in the temple. They've established that to where it was in the, the fall. So why can't we take the... Um, the story of Jesus' birth, put it in that time period and give him special, if, yeah. if you want to do a special honor time, it, let's remember it during that time. Like, like we well, had the remembrance of Let's be of honest. The, with, with traditional Christmas, if you strip out all the things that are of pagan origin, from the tree to the wreath to the merrymaking, the spirit of Christmas, I mean, this is the spirit of Saturnalia, even the gift giving, you strip all that away, nobody would want to do it. Everybody likes the music. Well, I don't blame them. They're catchy tunes, but it's like I've said before, almost all of them talk about angels singing. Mm-hmm. You know, Lester Summerall said he he believes in it. I, I don't have any doubt about this, that the choir, that fell, the with choir fell with Lucifer. And so if you got angels singing around something, maybe those aren't the right angels. It's things you got to look at. And the reason I'm saying it is because there's a whole year to look at it before it happens again. And I'm telling you, there's going to come a point where people are going to get slammed so hard by the enemy where God's not going to hold back all the things that the enemy can do with this, and it's going to get tougher and tougher. And if you think, uh, listen to me, if you think you can ever do deliverance ministry on somebody and that retaliation come, will not come back on you if you do Christmas, I'm telling you, guys, it's the truth. Yeah. I'm telling you out, out of my heart, my heart, it's, it's not judgmental because if anybody ever needed to be judged, it was me. God needed to judge me for my, that Christmas spirit that was in me. I mean, I, I fought it hard. Not get, I went ahead and, and didn't do it again, but it was still in my heart. I'd still go look at the lights. And there's a mesmerizing effect with this. What everybody's thinking is, oh, there's an anointing at Christmas time. It's a false anointing. It's a mesmerizing effect that makes you love the, the twinkle lights and, the, and all these things. And if you, strip, if you strip all of that away, if you strip every, absolutely everything away other than just thanking thanking the father that Jesus was born. If you just, most people wouldn't want it. Yeah. Well, you know where the lights come from, and this goes to, that's why you follow the origin and everything back. They would put a candle in the window. And a lot of times you'll see Christmas decorations of a candle, electric candle you put in the window, was to signify and tell the stag God that he was welcome in that home. Well, all of it. I, I, you know, I, every time I do this every year, and Mike, Mike and Steffi can testify to this, I'll say, I'm never mentioning this Christmas stuff again. I'm not going to mention it. I'm going to shut my mouth because people are tired of hearing it. But I, the reason that it keeps coming up is I know what's getting ready to happen. I know that little things that maybe have happened in the past where people's houses burned down <laughs> and, and this person gets sick with this and this happens and everything tears up. I know. I know what's getting ready to happen. It's going to get much worse because God's given time for everybody to put this position out. And I'm telling you, I don't know how in the world somebody tries to justify it at this point with everything that's out there. Yeah. It's, it's, it's part of Babylon. And so we can't fight this system and be stuck to it. No, you can't. You can't. You know, there's, there's things we can't change like... As far as the currency right now. Now, no telling what God's getting ready to do with the economy of this nation and other nations. There's no telling what things are going to look like. I think we may go to a barter system for a while. That's just my personal opinion. But you can't fight Babylon and be part of it. And I can tell you, any time we've ever just just kind of put a little toe out of what God's told us to do, it's not been good. Yeah, we get whacked because the enemy knows. 
We, and we, we know. Yeah. This it's it's not conjecture to us. When you look at the at look at the basis of this, the only way that you can justify doing Christmas is you got to do one whale of a dance. Yes. You got to dance over here and dance over there and say this and say that and I'm telling you guys with what's coming, if you're going to be in the war on God's side, you can't have that foot in Christmas. You can't do it. And that's why if I've ever talked to any person that has been a program multiple, I'll say, you can't do these occult things. You can't do Halloween. You can't participate in that. Or, or you'll get knocked back so quick that you won't make any progress. Well, look at Doc Marquis. Now, Doc Marquis, fourth or fifth generation Illuminati. So 100 and, well, I think it was like 140 years in the Illuminati. One of the first things he'd tell everybody, these are the occult holidays. And now he would stagger them out to where they were in 13-week breaks of seven and six. And and that Christmas was one of the big oh, ones. Oh, it's you can't deny how he breaks up those six and seven weeks. No. It's <laughs> and I mean, they even, they even changed the inauguration of the president to fall on one of those days. I mean, it's just over and over and over again. And so many other people have come out of the occult. Uh, as, as well as Christianity, I, I think one of the things that disturbed me the most, and I, a lot of this I'm going to deal with the coming out of Babylon book. I'm just going to try to get it documented. There it is. I, and to be truthful, I've kind of resisted it because I thought so many other people have already done such a wonderful job. But I, maybe I may approach a little bit different than they do. I, I guess I have my, my way of expressing things. But we, when we were watching, we were, we were kind of we kicked into gear. We were watching videos. We were doing research. And this one was one against Christmas. And it was like about 20 minutes into the video, I think, and this guy's not a Christian. He was an Islamic imam. And he was saying that the whole Christian Jesus is connected to Mithraism. It's the birth date of Mithra. It's the birth date of Apollo, which makes the Christian version of Jesus false. And I thought, oh, you see, that's so they're actually using our participation in something that is that was started in Babylon to dismiss who we say Jesus is. Well, because Islam has its own version of Jesus. What I think the enemy's done the most with Christmas is is he entangled our hearts in it. Yeah, <laughs> because there's there's good memories involved in it, and there's there's food, family, presents. You know, it's all good, warm fuzzies, and the warm fuzzies will trap you. Yeah. The warm fuzzies in anything. The the warm fuzz. You know, I had a warm fuzzy where my mom watched soap operas. I watched them, and that was one of the first things God dealt with me about. He said, "You you don't need to be watching these anymore." And so I just gradually started. You know, anything he was telling me, I was just moving it out, moving it out. And I don't know that we would have survived the severity of what came after us. And I don't I don't think that we're important. You know, a lot of people think, well, you think you're so important, a plane is going to crash into you, they sent a plane. I, I don't think it was important at all. I think what it was was I made a stand, and they were going to make an example out of me because I was telling to anybody to listen that called me on the phone or anything else, they're not going to destroy us. God's not going to let them destroy us. And so Satan was dang determined, watch me, I'm going to kill you, and then everybody will be afraid to ever fight again. Yeah. You know, when we look at all this, it's it's... If, if we don't get the basics down, you know, it, it's like in, what is it, Hebrews chapter 5, chapter 6, where Paul says, you know, you ought to be in advanced things right now, but if but I'm going to have to go back and teach you the rudimentary things. I think with some of these things are simple. Now, you know, if you can have wonderful time during the feast of the Lord, they're ones that God actually gave that. You know, it, it's like what when some of the things that we've done in the past is, you know, in Purim, which was was an additional one celebrating what God did in, in keeping his people free, and it also has a prophetic image of the Antichrist and stuff. As the Bible said, afterward they gave gifts to one another, celebrating, and so that, that'd be the time that we would give gifts. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus you also get all those wonderful after-Christmas sales, you know, where everything's 80% off. It wasn't a big thing like Christmas, no. but it was just, just a time that I thought we could— we could give gifts and just have a celebration that God God is going to protect his people, and that's that's yeah. what that's about. <laughs> and the truth is, you can take any of God's ho- ho- holy days, except for um, the atonement, mm-hmm. where you can't eat, and especially tabernacles. Imagine, you know, tabernacles, your, your family spending a week together celebrating God, and you're not, in fact, it's 
biblically inappropriate to fast, you're commanded not to fast because you're supposed to be celebrating before God and a week-long celebration with your family. And you know what? You can add all the warm fuzzies you want to it because it, it's a, a time of being with family. It's a time of being with other believers and just celebrating yeah, it's, God. It's okay to do it. It's not, it's not been... Um, as a matter of fact, you know, when one of the first things God, God told me, like as, as I was coming out and learning things and I was sitting on my front porch praying, and I've told you guys this before, but there may be some new listeners, and I was sitting out on the front porch and um, I heard God say, uh, the people in the occult are getting ready to defile the Feast of Tabernacles. And I, I had read Feast of Tabernacles because at that time I'd read through the Bible, but I didn't know anything about it. Or when and, it was going to be. No. And so uh, I, I said, well, God, how do I find out about the Feast of Tabernacles? And he said, go look at Leviticus 23. So I went inside, got well, my Bible. He also told you it was this weekend. No. Or the, no. Okay. I'll tell you how it went because it's yeah. hard to keep this straight. Um, he said, uh, I went inside and got my Bible. I saw it was... Uh, in Leviticus 23, and I thought, oh, my word, I'm hearing God. And then it said it was the uh, seventh month, the 15th day, I believe, um, is when the Feast of Tabernacles was. And so I may have the date wrong. I can't remember. I mean, I I knew then. And so I, I went in to where you were, and I said, how do I find out what is the seventh month like the 15th day, whatever the, the Feast of Tabernacles is. And you said, well, we'll have to have a Jewish calendar. And so when we got out the Jewish calendar, um, it was that next weekend. Yeah. And I thought, oh, okay, so God wants me to pray all this week that they can't defile the Feast of Tabernacles. And at the time I was thinking, I wonder why they defile the Feast of Tabernacles, because I didn't know much about any of that. But I just went, I started praying, and I said, I, I bind anything that's going to try to defile the Feast of Tabernacles and any occult workings. I just um, ask you to send angels, Father, and roadblock and everywhere. That's how I prayed that week. Then that next weekend was when the witch crawled in the van. Yeah, they retaliated because we stopped something, and it was supposed to be something nobody knew. And so now think about this for a minute. Why would they? Why would it be important to the kingdom of darkness to defile the Feast of Tabernacles? It's the same reason that in Islam, when they find out Jesus is supposed to come back in Jerusalem in the Eastern Gate, they put a graveyard there because they're so superstitious. They said that he would not come through a graveyard. Well, that's nothing to him because he can just pop the graves open or whatever. They they believe that by doing it, that they can halt or delay the return of Christ. Now imagine, because that's, that's all about the millennial reign, the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles is a divine rehearsal of the millennial reign of Christ. Well, if by them desecrating it, they believe that they can hinder the return of Christ, what happens when the believers start celebrating it with a pure heart in the Spirit of God? Hmm? We could hasten his return. So that, that was one of the reasons that I wanted to, wanted to mention that is because now, in contrast, when Christmas came around, <laughs> they weren't defiling that. They said it was theirs to begin with. Yeah. In fact, a lot of the occult look at us as defiling their holiday. Well, I think they look at us with jeers because they know they can hit us. Yeah. That's, and they hit us. Man, did they hit us. And I, and I went into that Christmas after I was told that I was going to celebrate because I thought, well, that's a big lie. And I'm going to celebrate and God's going to protect us and we'll show you. That's how I was going into it. And then after that is, man, sickness like we'd never had. Everything tore up. It, it was just, it was crazy. It was too much. And God was allowing us to see this is something they can hit you with. Yeah. And so if people could see it from that perspective, I think it would make them look at it a little differently. You mean this is something that if I do, the occult can have an actual breach to, to attack me with? Yeah, well, the occult, they have are there people that have gotten saved that said, we'll go into the Christmas services because we pull the violation of the Word of God. We pull all that psychic violation out, and we use that to use against them the rest of the year. And so, yes, they, they do. And but what power there is in the body of Christ, we go back and we start doing God's things God's way. And to shake off, there's, there is, there is a, where we, where we get the word baptism, mikvah. 
when God set his people free from Egypt, and now they're, they're getting ready to meet God on Mount Sinai, God had them wash for three days. Now, three is a number of perfection. And God had them wash for three days so that there wasn't even the dust of Egypt left on them. There wasn't the smell of Egypt left on them on their clothes when they were getting ready to meet with God. Now, we go, we go forward, and there's a guy named John the Baptist who said, make straight the pathway, path of God because God's getting ready to come. He called them to repentance and baptism which for, for the Jewish mind, they would think back on Moses and Mount Sinai. And it prepared the people's heart for Jesus. I think as we, as we approach the return of Christ, that the anointing of John the Baptist is going to come once again. Mm-hmm. And because it's actually the spirit of Elijah calling us to repentance. Now, he was calling to repentance the people of God living in a Torah-observant community. And he was calling them to repentance. Mm -hmm. How much more does he need to call us to repentance who have even abandoned the commandments of God and then to baptize, to wash, get rid of that old man? And there's so much about baptism. You know, it's not only identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's also dealing with God's victory over the Nephilim in Genesis 6. And there's so much to it as well as just saying, okay, I'm washing off everything that I repented of. I'm now washing it off of me so that there's not even the smell of it on me anymore. Because I'm getting ready to be, I'm getting ready to be confronted with God. I'm getting ready to meet God. God's getting ready to do something. Anytime that God has ever moved, real revival. Anytime God has ever moved, it has only been after a season of repenting and spiritually washing. Yeah, we need to be washed. By the water of the Word. Yeah, that's right. Well, and so so this is, you know, that year that I think that we're going to learn what we need to learn, um, have that open door out of Babylon. God's going to make a way, and we're going to, Head on out of it <laughs> in yeah. any way. You know, I'm, I don't have any doubt there's things that I've got to, to deal with still. You know, it's just, it's, it is so intertwined in who we are. Yeah. I mean, from the time we've been born, this is the system we've been raised in. Yeah. And, you know, we, we, the people, because, you know, where's the power? Where's the power? To get the power, you got to get both feet out of Babylon and both feet into the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Especially in this day and this hour, God is not going to empower something that can still be influenced by the enemy. Well, it's it's a total change. I mean, there's a total change coming. And I think all these years leading up to this is <clears throat> us learning different things, mostly the hard way. Yes. I hope you guys don't ever have to learn anything the way I did because I was so stubborn. I had to learn it the hard way. <laughs> and, you know, it wasn't pleasant many times. But I'll tell you one thing. It's the key is, do you want to get rid of it? Do you want to lay down anything that you've got to lay down so that God can use you? Do you want to have any mindset changed so God can use you? Are you willing to, um, you know, just walk a different path than you've ever walked before? Because that, that's the key. Yeah. God will come in and help us. He's going to come in and, and make a way for deliverance and healing and everything else. He just needs us to say, okay. You know, because there's, there's been a kind of a struggle in me, and I'll, I'll share this with you, because, you know, I was split in pieces, and I was, there were a couple of parts of me trained militarily. And it was it, the training was um, for the purpose of making sure that these communists didn't take over the nation. Essentially, that's what it was. And um, they killed the general <coughs> that interrupted the 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 first programming to reprogram the people for that. So those parts of me were trained on a mission. You get this mission done, and it was a certain way you were supposed to get it done. So now um, now that I've seen the big picture, every part of me has to just totally yield unto the way that God, <coughs> God wants it done. Yeah. Because that wasn't, a, that wasn't a godly mission. That was a patriotic mission to save the nation from what was being planned 
for a long time. It's, it's <laughs> like, okay, we got the mission done. We get to retire right, now. Right, right. Yeah. And so it's, it's like in, in the past when I would say, you know, okay, God, every part of me I submit to you. And I would always hear those military parts say, I didn't sign on for this. They signed on for the mission to save the nation, but they didn't sign on, on for the rest of this stuff. That, that is, is really hard to do. To me, the mission stuff looked easy compared to what all this in, involves. Because those, those parts of me, would the only way they'd know to deal with somebody is march them like a drill sergeant. And that's what I did with one person one day. You know, and it, it and I, I should, I didn't even know that's what was going on, to tell you the truth. Um, but they just kept falling asleep. We couldn't get them to stay awake, to listen to anything, to pray or anything. And I said, okay. And those parts of me just came to the forefront. They said, we're going to get up every morning at 6 o'clock. We're going to march. And if you don't stay awake, you're going to fall and hit the ground. So we're going to march, and you're going to learn to pray that way. Yeah. And now that, that was, uh, could God use that? Yeah, but I would never do something like that again because I didn't even understand <laughs> What's going on? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because because back then, um, there were so many little kids in jeopardy that wouldn't have had a snowflake's chance and you know where of making it unless somebody did something. And now I look back and I think, well, God, forgive me for anything that I did that, that wasn't by your leading, by the Holy Spirit. Um, but that's something that, that I think God has been really working on me to get me to the place where every part of me can flow with him because in the past i can tell you if those parts of me were up in the conscious realm they 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 would attack the enemy with full force like they they would have just went after the enemy well it had blown the people out of the you know what i mean like you can't mm -hmm. deal with people like a drill sergeant i can deal with the with the demonic like a drill sergeant it doesn't have to be rough. It's just it's just very bold. You don't have a right to be there. You're coming out. That's it. But when you're dealing with people, you got to be, you got to be gentle. Pastoral. Yeah. Yeah. And so so just to give you an idea of how difficult <laughs> this whole last thirty years has been, uh, I I just pray that anything that we have gone through that we can share with you will keep you guys from having to go down the road that I went. Because it was one rough old road, and, and all glory to God that he got us through. We're all safe. His covenant that he's going to take care of all of us uh, is so firm, and I'm so thankful for his holy angels that have charge over us. Um, but we're getting ready to go into a time where everybody's going to have to deal with the things that we did to a degree. Yeah. And so th the key is, are you willing? Yeah. Are you willing to give it all? One of the principles we see when Israel entered into the promised land, everybody had to deal with their giants because you were given land in that territory. Now you could have others come in and, and help you, but you had to deal, you had to face your own giants. Mm -hmm. And that, that, that's where we're at. God is saying, I want, I want to shake you, wake you. I want to equip you. I want to break every bondage off your life, get, to, get it to where you can hear from headquarters that you know the weapons of your warfare because this is the season that I'm going to anoint you to take down your Goliaths. And we want everybody to be ready. That's why, that's why we're saying examine everything, pray through yeah. everything, uh, make sure everything lines up with the Word of God, uh, and, and take the time. And uh, I tell you what, there's a wealth of stuff that's in the original languages that all you need is a good Strong's concordance. And, I mean, there's, there's, there are books that are keynoted to Strong's or the software is even easier. You just put the mouse over it, and pfft, there's all the definitions to really see. And uh, the powerful, powerful stuff. And, and, and don't dismiss the Holy Spirit leading you and showing you. And when the Holy Spirit starts getting on your case about something, don't run away from it. Embrace it. Yeah, just grab a hold of it and say, if you're against God's plan in my life, you're leaving. Yeah. That's what I've had to do. Yeah. Um, and it works. I mean, we we're, uh, we have authority over our vessel. Yes, we do. And we don't have to let the enemy have any inroads. And if we have mindsets that are, are very strong, they can be changed. Absolutely. And that that's the whole purpose of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, pulling down, bringing every yeah, thought it. into captivity of Christ. And so, guys, it's time to roll up your sleeves. It's time for war. I want to walk out of that door out of Babylon, don't you? Yep. <laughs> and we're going to do it by God's grace and for God's purpose. And, Father, we just pray for a person who listens to this podcast 
Father, I ask that you would stir them to action. Stir them to self-examination under the, the blazing, glorious light of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. And Father, give us the tenacity to be merciless. Let us drive out the ites. Let us take down the giants. Let us bring everything back to your kingdom and your kingdom alone. There's a reason why Jesus and John both said, now the kingdom of God is at hand. You better repent. Because repentance opens the door to the kingdom manifesting. Father, let us be quick to repent. Let us be quick to embrace correction from your word so that we can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.